Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. So I know I've been on hiatus for a couple of months now, um, but I should be getting back into the swing of things. Um, so stay tuned for some new content. I have a few things in the works right now, and I'll be making some special announcements soon. So keep your ear to the ground is what I'm saying. In this installment, I'm taking a look at a YouTube channel called Local 58 Community Television. As of now, Local 58 has seven videos on their channel. The videos tend to vary in length from anywhere between one and five minutes. I thought this would be an opportune chance to do a deep dive on an independent art project, specifically one that I feel merits your attention. Local 58 has released a number of seemingly disparate works. What I'm wondering is, is there any indication that these videos relate to one another in some way? Well, for starters, they're all pieces of footage that have aired on this fictitious television station, Local 58 WCLV-TV. We can perhaps construe this as a device to exhibit a number of totally independent artistic endeavors. Perhaps that's the pragmatic way to think about it. But if there is a common theme here, I would say it's the manner in which media and technology have shaped the dominant perspectives of our time. And I dare say there's a distinct apocalyptic tone that resonates throughout the series. This work is concerned with the course of history. It's concerned with the past, the present, and future of civilization. I think what makes Local 58 both effective and cohesive as an art project is the tension it generates as a result of the work's adherence to the formal trappings of a local TV station, trappings which of course stand in tonal opposition to the discordant mishmash of short vignettes that constitute the actual substance of the videos. If there is a cohesive fictional universe that can be possibly construed by these outlandish vignettes, it is clear that this universe can only be vaguely inferred through the details laid out sparingly in select moments over the course of these seven videos. Though I do think literal-minded contemplation is only going to get us so far. Perhaps it's what's unknown that really generates the horror in this series. Now, in this video, I'll be focusing my analytical lens on You Are On The Fastest Available Route, the very first video in the Local 58 series. It was written and edited by Chris Straub, and it was based on an idea by Mikey Newman. The video was uploaded on June 19th, 2016, and it's only 3 minutes and 39 seconds long, but I hope by the end of this analysis, you'll appreciate just how thematically rich the material really is. As you may have gathered based on the title of this video, I am yet again attempting a close reading, what is in essence a shot-by-shot -shot analysis of the work. I found this method to be fruitful in the past. Specifically, this is the method I employed in my Petscop investigation series, in addition to the first installment of my analysis of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. We'll see how it goes this time around. Oh, and when you hear this noise along with the word footnote, that's an indication that I'm taking a second to point out something that I think is noteworthy. Yep, the footnote thing is happening. Patent pending. So without further ado, let's get going. Here's a breakdown of events. We are first exposed to a channel lineup, the likes of which you might see on a local TV station. As you might expect, a contemporary jazz track starts playing. Apparently, we're watching a channel called Local 58, WCLV-TV. Looks like it's pretty late. The station schedule appears. At 12.05 a.m., something called the Midnight Movie is playing. And at 1.55 a.m., paid programming will begin. Although, this is strange. The text for paid programming starts to get deleted almost as soon as it appears. Footnote. In terms of setting the mood here, Local 58's aesthetic gives the impression of a television being left on late at night. I should also note that a number of elements towards the very beginning of this work raise the question of who exactly is overseeing the station's operations. Let's take, for instance, the fact that the text for paid programming starts to disappear, almost as though someone is intentionally deleting it. 
It happens so quickly that you might either miss it or not really have the chance to consider the potential implications. In addition, the fact that the video is riddled with static indicates that perhaps we are watching an old VHS tape. Let's also note the aspect ratio, 4-3. It's an older setup, one more commonly used in previous decades. It raises the question, when exactly was this video recorded? If indeed we are watching a recording. Each of these elements work towards building a sense of ambiguity, which looms over the rest of the work. I don't believe we should think of this occurrence strictly in literal terms. That is to say, I don't think we need to try and figure out who in particular is messing with the schedule, and I don't think we necessarily need to understand their intentions. Rather, it is perhaps best to understand it as the start of a thematic motif. The theme being that there is some underlying force at play. Something not immediately evident is acting behind the scenes. Let's continue. The music abruptly stops and the video cuts to what appears to be dash cam footage. A person is driving in the rain. There's a bridge in the distance. You can hear the pitter pattering of raindrops on the driver's windshield. A voice says, proceed to the highlighted route. Based on the tone of the voice, it's clear that this is the driver's GPS, their global positioning system. Footnote. What we have here, dash cam footage, a GPS leading the way, these are products of the modern world. The manner in which this story is being told is only possible through the use of this modern technology. Keep this in mind as the video progresses, and I think it might shed a bit of light on some of the underlying themes here. Let's proceed. The GPS gives additional directions. The date at the top left-hand portion of the video indicates that it's November 21st, 2014. It's nearly 2 a.m. The GPS indicates that the driver will arrive at their destination in 2 hours and 28 minutes. Based on the current time, that would land the driver at their destination at around 4.30 in the morning. The GPS gives additional directions and relays to the driver that they are on the fastest available route. Footnote. Let's stop for a minute to consider the significance of the video's name, which was uttered just now by the GPS. You are on the fastest available route. This is a phrase commonly integrated into GPS software. To state the obvious, it is a message that indicates to the driver that the GPS has determined the quickest way to get to their destination. Of course, there are always other routes available, perhaps even more scenic routes. In light of the novel manner in which this story is formatted, namely the use of GPS technology to signal key events to the viewer, it might be appropriate to consider another potential motif convenience, namely the convenience afforded to people in developed nations by this sort of technology. Is there a hidden cost to this convenience? Is a value system based largely on convenience really the best way of life? Let's move forward. The video glitches out a bit and the footage cuts ahead a few minutes. The GPS directs the driver to get on the highway and again the footage cuts ahead, this time by a little over an hour. It's 3.22 in the morning. The GPS redirects the driver, purportedly due to heavy traffic, indicating that they should get off on a nearby exit. Although, I guess I should note here that I don't really see a whole lot of traffic on the road. Again, the GPS relays that the driver is on the fastest available route. A beeping noise can be heard, and again, the video cuts ahead. It's now 4.47 a.m. The driver appears to be in a considerably more remote area. The GPS indicates that they will arrive at their destination in 14 minutes. Again, the video cuts ahead. It's now 5.12 a.m. Footnote. In formal terms, the increasingly frequent jump cuts create suspense by perpetually throwing the viewer into an unfamiliar scenario. The intervals by which the video moves ahead help to create a sense of urgency, specifically towards the end of the video. The GPS provides certain expectations as to when the driver will reach their destination. A certain kind of dissonance is created when those expectations aren't met. The first time we might write it off as a traffic issue. After all, the GPS notes that it has to reroute the driver due to traffic. However, when it happens again, this is the work signaling to the viewer that something is wrong. One might be starting to get the sense that this GPS is a little wacky. It might even be fair to say it's unreliable. Let's proceed. The driver begins moving more slowly. 
They aren't able to see what's in front of them beyond, say, 10 or so feet. The GPS spouts off, rerouting, make a U-turn. And yet again, the video cuts ahead. This time it's 527 AM. It's clear the driver has been directed to a remote area in the woods. The GPS directs the driver to head east and then follow signs for do not enter. And then the GPS directs the driver to continue on unnamed road, then in 300 feet, turn off your headlights. The driver continues onwards and stops, presumably having just arrived at their destination. A strange pulsing sound can be heard, after which the driver turns off their headlights. A loud roaring sound emanates from the surrounding area. The driver then attempts to escape from whatever is making the noise. Meanwhile, the GPS continually directs the driver to make a U-turn. And then, well... Your destination in 250 feet. Rerouting. Your destination will be in 50 feet. You will arrive at your destination. In 1989, a political scientist by the name of Francis Fugiyama wrote an essay called The End of History, in which he considers the possibility that with the end of the Cold War, human civilization has entered a new era, a period he referred to as the end of history, essentially meaning that we as humans have landed on the right ideas in terms of our political and economic development. This concept, the so-called end of history, was not exactly a new idea at the time. The highly influential conservative philosopher Georg Friedrich Hegel considered the Prussian state to be the fulfillment of history. Conversely, Karl Marx thought communism would be the final stage of political development. Fugiyama saw the collapse of the USSR as an indication that communism had ultimately failed and thus the liberal democratic state had proved itself capable of replicating the conditions necessary for its own existence, thus sustaining itself as the dominant system on an indefinite basis. Fugiyama cites the widespread availability of VCRs as evidence of this. This example might seem quaint by today's standards, but one could just as easily use smartphones as an example. It's estimated that roughly 5 billion people across the world have mobile devices, and about half of these devices are indeed smartphones. The advancement and availability of certain kinds of technology is often cited by those who seek to affirm the virtues of our present system. But is it possible that technology will play a major role in upending our present system? This is something I want you to keep in mind as I get into the meat of my analysis of Local 58. Let's consider the dash cam as a lens through which this abstract narrative is relayed. The entire concept of the dash cam hinges upon the legal construct of liability. It is a device used almost exclusively for the purposes of limiting one's liability. In the event of a car accident, the footage can be referred to in order to determine who is at fault. And yet, in this work, it is used to present a, well, I guess you would say it's a paranormal event. In the real world, the issue of liability plays a major role in determining how this technology is used. For instance, in Russia, nearly every driver has a dash cam in their vehicle. This is in large part due to a combination of ineffective and corrupt law enforcement and a plethora of scam artists looking to make a quick buck by jumping in front of your car and saying they were run over. As it turns out, these historical circumstances have given rise to a proliferation of car crash compilations. And since the use of dash cams in Russia is practically ubiquitous, it only makes sense that multiple dash cams in the country captured footage of the meteor that exploded over Chalabinsk. This isn't just some factoid I'm talking about because I think it's interesting. 
I'm trying to make the general point that widespread adoption of a given technology gives rise to new possibilities, such as the capturing of, say, a car accident that otherwise would have only been witnessed by those on the scene. It also gives rise to new possibilities in the realm of art, be it cinematic, literary, or otherwise. After all, this work would not have been possible were it not for the advent of the dash cam and the GPS, both of which are integral to the material's narrative. But I would assert that new technologies also have the ability to change the way we think in certain fundamental ways. With this in mind, we might also consider the significance of the GPS in terms of its use as a plot device. The GPS, Global Positioning System, is a pretty interesting piece of technology. You know, engineers actually have to account for Einstein's theory of relativity when calibrating their systems. Due to the effects predicted by both theories of general and special relativity, clocks aboard the satellites in orbit are about 38 microseconds faster per day than clocks on the ground. That might sound insignificant, but the cumulative effect would be disastrous for our navigation systems, were it not for the engineers calibrating them in accordance with Einstein's theories. Now, I'm not bringing this up simply because it's an interesting bit of trivia, although it certainly is. I'm talking about it because I want to emphasize just how advanced GPS technology really is, at least relative to previous navigation methods. I mean, we have to rely on a relatively modern scientific theory in order to even understand certain phenomenon in relation to this technology. From a purely narrative standpoint, it seems the GPS in this video is directing the driver to the location of some kind of beast, which in all likelihood leads to the driver's demise. It is critically important, in my view, to understand the GPS as a sort of de facto agent, as it were. In the realm of navigation, the GPS does the thinking so the driver doesn't have to. The role of human agency is, at best, marginal in this particular work. We don't ever see the driver, we don't see them interact with anyone, we don't even hear their voice. By all indications, they're alone in the car, and all we really see them do is respond to the directions provided by the GPS. In a practical sense, the driver is acting in a way that is formally identical to the way an automaton would act. They're blindly following a set of predetermined instructions. I will assert here that acting like an automaton is precisely what leads to the downfall of our protagonist. The driver fails to exercise their critical thinking abilities. There are, after all, a number of warning signs that would seem to indicate that something is wrong, that perhaps the driver is being led somewhere dangerous. The number of times the GPS has to reroute, the fact that it directs the driver to follow signs for do not enter, and most obvious of all, the fact that it actually tells the driver to turn off their headlights. All of these events to me constitute a rather clear indication that maybe, just maybe, the driver should stop adhering to the computer's directions. But the driver fails to recognize these warning signs. Is it possible they're in some kind of trance? Well, yeah, maybe. But it's worth asking what warning signs we are perhaps failing to recognize in our own lives. It's also worth thinking about how we are made to act like automatons on a day-to-day -day basis. The underlying presumption that the GPS is giving directions in a neutral fashion, that it's merely guiding the driver to their desired destination in this work, is, in very basic terms, ideological. One's ideology is the lens through which they perceive reality, and everyone operates with various ideological predilections. The idea that the GPS could not possibly be directing the driver towards their own demise is one that is imposed on the driver. The idea of the GPS in a cultural context is such that it can only really figure out the fastest way to get from point A to point B. It can't possibly think, can it? But the scope of the GPS in this work is not strictly navigational. I don't believe it's too much of a stretch to say that the GPS serves certain ends. The question of what particular ends this computer serves is ambiguous. But I think it's fair to say that it's something nefarious, especially given the way the video ends. 
From a thematic standpoint, it makes sense to understand both the dash cam and the GPS in this here video as symbols, technological feats representing the peak of modernity. Based on the events depicted in this video, one might be tempted to interpret the work in apocalyptic terms. If pieces of technology such as the GPS or the dash cam work as a correlate for modernity, superficially, it appears the work is suggesting that certain elements or aspects of modernity are leading us to ruin. And, well, I can't help but point out that this maps onto reality in a number of ways. The proliferation of nuclear weapons, as well as climate change, both pose existential risks to humanity, as spelled out by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in their decision to move the doomsday clock two minutes to midnight in January of 2018. In addition, the scientists cited, quote, increased use of information warfare to undermine democracy around the world, amplifying risk from these and other threats, and putting the future of civilization in extraordinary danger. So too would I argue that advances in automation as well as artificial intelligence both pose a potentially serious challenge to our economic system. A recent study suggests that robots could displace up to 20 million jobs by the year 2030, with lower income regions being more vulnerable to job displacement. And that's just within the next 10 years or so. It's worth asking, what's the forecast for 50 years? What about 100? The extent to which any given technology either reinforces or subverts the status quo directly affects how that technology is understood in a cultural context. There's been a shift in consciousness over the course of history. Increasingly, it seems we have relegated navigation to computers. The same is true in the sphere of stock market speculation, a trend which some argue could potentially exacerbate a future stock market crash. This is the trajectory of modernity. I don't want to frame these developments as intrinsically bad. I'm not a technological determinist. Nor am I a Luddite or some kind of anarcho-primitivist or anything like that really. I don't believe that any particular kind of technology is intrinsically bad or destined to lead humanity to ruin. I have repeatedly belabored the point on my channel that any given technology is a product of the society in which it was created and should be understood in that context. And it's really how we make use of the technology that matters. I would argue that these trends we're seeing, which suggest potentially disastrous outcomes in the future, spell disaster precisely because of their usage, not because of the technology itself. And the notion that one needs to use any given piece of technology in a particular way is ideological. I would argue that we need to repurpose all technology towards emancipatory ends in a way that benefits society as a whole. Computers are able to perform increasingly complex tasks. This is something we should be celebrating since, you know, as we are able to relegate the more repetitive, tedious, and labor-intensive types of work to computers and robots, we humans will be able to focus on more fulfilling forms of labor, and perhaps even a bit of leisure every now and then. I know, what a utopian idea. The thing is, though, in our present economic system, the vast majority of individuals are valued solely in terms of their productivity. So what happens when the vast majority of working people in the world become outmoded entirely? There's simply not a historical precedent for this. Due to the complexity of both our economic system and our environment, the impact these developments will have is virtually impossible to predict. But the degree to which any given technology will accelerate the contradictions of our capitalist economic system, and I'm speaking especially with respect to automation here, is perhaps the foremost significant historical question of our time. And, of course, with the potential for a catastrophic economic crisis, unfortunately, there also comes the potential for right-wing political movements which aim to scapegoat minorities. You know, uh, fascism, that sort of thing. I think the beast in this video represents a dark potentiality. It signifies the danger that looms in the not-too-distant future. 
I think of it as the underbelly of this neat little technocratic utopia you might see espoused by those in, for instance, the transhumanist movement. Those who embrace the advancement of AI, automation, and other technologies. But of course, transhumanists at least understand the radical implications of advances in artificial intelligence and increased automation. Those who brush off or downplay the potential for these developments to upend our entire system, those who argue, for instance, that other jobs will replace the ones lost by advancements in AI and automation, are not merely naive or in denial. No, it's far worse than that. They're blinded by a certain form of ideology, one which prizes capitalism's ability to adapt to various circumstances, to subsume, appropriate, and commodify every last bit of culture in existence. But every system has a breaking point. And there comes a time when the dominant ideology of a given period becomes insufficient in terms of its ability to properly account for what is happening in the world. I would argue that coming face to face with the beast in this here video signifies the tension that occurs when the veil of this ideology is lifted, when the material reality of a moment in time makes itself apparent. In these circumstances, the true poverty of such an ideology will be laid bare for all to see. I'll have a link to Local 58's Patreon in the video description. I encourage you to throw a few bucks their way if you like what they do. I should note the disclaimer on their Patreon page. You have the right not to support community television, but through inaction, you are contributing to the death of the medium. I don't necessarily condone this vulgar individualist way of thinking, but you know, I just thought it was interesting. Anyway, I'm still in the process of deciding whether or not to cover more videos in the Local 58 series, so let me know if you'd like to see more. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Any amount, large or small, would be highly appreciated. Thank you for watching, and good night.